Well, good morning. Open to Ephesians chapter 4 with us today. Ephesians chapter 4 as we start a brand new series called One, Dealing with Conflict in the Church from Ephesians chapter 4. And if you've been paying attention to our sermon cards that we give you from time to time, uh, you know that this was not originally the series we had planned uh, to do next. Uh, we were going to do one on spiritual disciplines, but we have decided to do that as our summer Sunday school class. And so uh, please uh, stay tuned. There'll be more information about that class coming up. And uh, it's going to be a great time together. Uh, but today we are starting a series called One, and uh, we have new sermon cards in your bulletin. You can check out to see where we're going teaching-wise this summer. But if you can, get over to Ephesians chapter 4 with me. And uh, once again, will you join me in a word of prayer as we open God's Word together? God, we humbly come before you and ask you to teach us we pray, Lord, that we would be sensitive to what you are saying, that our ears would be open. God, as we talk about conflict, conflict among your people, and as we talk about the unity that you desire for us, I pray, Lord, that we would uh, be honest with ourselves, honest with ourselves about how we live in community with others, how we contribute to either community or conflict. And may we be sensitive to your Holy Spirit convicting our hearts and exposing areas where we need to change, attitudes that need to change, actions that need to change, and relationships maybe that we need to go and, and deal with uh, for your sake, the sake of your church and your community, the people of God. We thank you, Lord, for this time and your word together. And again, we ask that you would speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. He was a dead man walking, moments away from being betrayed from one of his closest friends, arrested for a crime that he did not commit, put on trial, convicted, tortured for sport, and then brutally murdered on a cross. What would you do with your last moments, knowing that this was your fate? Of course, we're talking about Jesus Christ. And with those moments, he went to a garden with 12 of his closest friends. And he prayed. He prayed. He prayed for himself. He prayed for the, the ability to fulfill the mission that the Father had given him. He prayed for his disciples that they would be protected and purified by the word of God. And then he prayed for another group. He prayed for those who would come later. Those who would believe in Jesus because of the words of his followers. He prayed for you and me. He prayed for those who would come perhaps decades, centuries, even millennia later. He prayed with you in mind. And we have what he prayed in John chapter 17. Verse 20, it says this, I pray not only for these, meaning his disciples, but also for those who believe in me through their word. He is praying for us. And this is what he prays. May they all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me, so that they may be completely one. That the world may know you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Jesus prayed for us, for all those who would believe in him throughout the centuries. He prayed that we would be one. Then we come to Ephesians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul is writing. He's writing a letter to the church in Ephesus. And that letter was then going to be circulated to other churches in the area. And as he was writing, he was a prisoner awaiting trial. He was given freedom to write and to study, but he was a prisoner nonetheless. And the outcome of the trial was unknown. For 
For all he knew, he would never be a free man again. For all he knew, he would meet the same fate as his master and Lord Jesus Christ and be put to death because, because of his faith. And what did Paul do with this limited freedom that he was granted? He wrote letters to people that he cared for. He wrote to these churches that he helped to establish. He wrote to people that he knew very well. And what did he write to these churches, to these people? He wrote about the gospel. He wrote about the good news of Jesus Christ. He wrote how what Jesus did for us should influence how we live, what we do. It should influence how we interact with those around us in our everyday lives. And in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul writes how the church is to live as Jesus prayed. The church is to live as one. Paul wrote to many people. Many will read this letter after he writes. But he writes that these many people should not function as many, but as one. Because Jesus died on the cross to make them one. And so let's read these words together in Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 1. It says this, Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. The bottom line for today is Paul's opening statement, live worthy of your calling. Live worthy of your calling. And that begs the question, what is our calling? See, Paul here is assuming that these readers in Ephesus would understand what their calling is. And he assumes that because he has already told them what their calling is. See, when we come to a passage like Ephesians 4, oftentimes we read it in isolation. But there are three chapters that are before this leading into what he says here in chapter 4. And so I would encourage each of you to go back this week and read through the first three chapters. In fact, read through the entire letter in one sitting. It is a rich letter, one of my favorite letters in Scripture to read. But as we go back and look at what this calling is, I'm just going to summarize it in a few verses from chapters 1 and 2. And first we go to Ephesians 1 verse 5, where Paul writes this, He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Part of our calling is that we are adopted into God's family. Verse 3 tells us that we were actually chosen by God, chosen and adopted, brought into the family of God. Why? Because it gave God pleasure to do so. Verse 7 tells us this, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, that He richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. See, there was a problem. God desired to adopt us into His family to bring us near, and yet we were far from God. We were separated from God because of our sin, because of our trespasses, as my Bible reads. And we could not be a part of the family of God. And so God sent Jesus. And through his blood, through his death on the cross, we were able to be granted forgiveness. We were able to be redeemed. That is, brought into the family of God. It enabled our adoption. And it is all because of his grace. Grace that he pours out on us richly with all wisdom and understanding. Not only have we been forgiven, not only have we been adopted, but we were also given a special gift. In chapter 1, verse 13, we read this. In Him, you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. We are given the very Spirit of God to live in us, to empower us to live the life that we are called to live. 
And we are told here how we receive this gift, how we are adopted, how we are forgiven. It says, when you believed, it is through our faith. Our faith in who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Which leads us to chapter 2, verse 8, which says, For you are saved by grace through faith. This is not from yourselves, it's God's gift. You're saved by grace that is unmerited favor. You don't deserve it. You cannot earn it. This is not from yourselves. It is all because of God. It is his gift to you. And all that we do to receive it is to believe. Believe in what Jesus has done for us. Believe in our need for Jesus and turn to him in desperation. That is our, a summary of our calling That is what we are to live worthy of. Live worthy of that calling. Paul now goes into describing how to live that way. And we first see that you are to live in spirit-empowered unity. You are to live in spirit-empowered unity. To live worthy of your calling means you are to live in unity. Unity that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Let's read the first three verses of this passage again. Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. As we have seen already, Paul has spent three chapters laying out what it means to be a Christian, what Jesus has done for us. And chapter 4 to the end of the book now describes how we are to live in light of that. And Paul, before he launches into talking about how we are to live practically, appeals to two things. The first thing he appeals to is the fact that he was writing from prison. He says, therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling. That, That word urge is to beg, is to plead. And he pleads with them, first of all, because he himself is a prisoner. This should raise our awareness to how serious these words of Paul are for us. We should really consider them. And what Paul is essentially saying is, my commitment to Jesus Christ has led me to prison. That is the result of my being willing to live in obedience to the calling that I have received. And what I'm about to describe for you is what you are being led into. It's the sacrifice you need to make because of living out the calling that you have received. Secondly, Paul appeals to that calling. Because you have been forgiven, because you have the Spirit of God living inside of you, because you have received these gifts and blessings from God, live this way. And the first thing that we see is that we are to live in Spirit-empowered unity. This unity is talked about in verse 3, where he says, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Notice that this unity, it says that we are to keep it. It doesn't say that we are to create it, that we are to manufacture it, it, that we are to effort to develop unity between us. No, it is a gift given to us by the Spirit, established by the Holy Spirit. We simply are given it as a gift. We are entrusted with it. We are to protect it. We are to prioritize it. We are to preserve it. The unity. We can certainly destroy it, but we are to work hard to keep it. This church was very diverse. There were rich and poor, Jew and non-Jew, slaves and free people, men and women, and yet they were all to be one, unified, brought together by the Holy Spirit, and they were to keep that unity. In fact, that word for unity can also be translated oneness. They were to literally live as one. No matter how many there were, no matter how diverse they were, they were to live as one. So how do we do this? How do we keep and preserve the unity of the Spirit that is entrusted to us? We do it by embracing that which the Holy Spirit is producing in our lives. Notice in verse 2, there are five different things that we are told, five different attributes that we are to put into practice that the Holy Spirit is to be developing in our lives. 
How do we know that the Holy Spirit produces these things? Because a very similar list exists in Galatians chapter 5. And there, these attributes are called the fruit of the Spirit. It's what the Spirit is developing in us. What the Spirit is producing. What the Spirit is growing. And so how do we keep and preserve the unity of the Spirit? By living out the fruit of the Spirit in our relationships with one another. Well, what are these attributes? What is the fruit? First, we see humility. Humility. Where there is division, pride is always behind it. Conflict does not exist where there's a spirit of humility. If you are in conflict with someone, the first question you should ask of yourself is, am I being humble? Am I being humble? You see, pride led to the very first sin, and pride leads to every sin since. And where there is the sin of conflict between people, there is always pride. And healing these relationships begin with humility. Secondly, we see that we are to have all humility and gentleness. We are to be gentle. We don't always like the word gentle. Another word that this can be translated as that we really don't like, and that is meekness. Guys especially, we don't want to be meek or gentle because meek sounds weak, and we don't want to be seen as weak. But gentleness and meekness is not weak. In fact, it's great strength, but controlled strength. It's knowing that you could be harsh, but you choose not to. You could be brash, but you are gentle instead. One writer takes this even further, where he de defines gentleness and meekness as this, the absence of the disposition to assert personal rights, either in the presence of God or of men. What this means is you may have the right to be harsh. You may have the right to be angry, to be frustrated. But you lay aside that right and you are gentle instead and you pursue peace and unity even though you could stand on your rights and principles. But you lay them aside for the sake of peace and unity. We live in a society that is built on the idea of protecting and exercising personal rights. It is my right to say this. It is my right to do this. It is my right. On social media, we see all the time people posting about their God-given or most often constitutional right to say what they're going to say or do what they're going to do. Let me ask you, how often does standing on your rights lead to peace and unity? How often does posting in that way produce peace and unity between people? Or most often, couldn't you agree with me that it leads to a war of words and disunity and strife between people? On this topic, one writer said, be careful of standing on your rights, for then God may stand on his. We must take note that in the church, we often are called to lay aside our personal rights for the sake of others. Gentleness. Next, we see patience. How often does hastiness produce conflict? Progress is prioritized over people. We need to get stuff done. And so we bulldoze over people to get stuff done. Or we are short with people. Instead of being patient with people, we are quick to snap at people's quirks or annoyances or flaws. Quick to be offended. Rather than patiently waiting, patiently enduring, patiently overlooking their faults. We are in a society that is promoting offense. It is popular to be offended. It is hip to take an offense at something or someone. And yet we as Christians are called to be patient, overlooking the quirks and annoyances and faults of others. 
which leads to the next one that takes patience and, and ratchets it up to another level, and that is bearing with one another. Literally, this means to put up with others. How often do we put up with others? You know, we like to call them out. How many areas of conflict never needed to become con uh, an area of conflict, but it does because we're not overlooking things. We're not putting up with things. But this word here also is often used in the context of suffering and persecution. Meaning that to bear with one another often means that we put others first and overlook things often at a cost to ourselves. It sometimes hurts to put up with each other, to overlook the faults and annoyances of others. But we are to do so for the sake of unity. Now what Paul is not advocating for here is for the vulnerable and the helpless to just accept or endure abuse. Abuse is not what he is talking about. He is talking about those who have the ability and the opportunity to step up, to challenge back, to fight back, to respond in harshness, but they choose not to for the sake of unity, even if that means that they pay a price to do so. And we are told how we can do this, bearing with one another in love. Love. This is the Greek word agape, which is the word used for God's love for us, for God's love for His people. It's the love that, that never goes away. It is the love that doesn't matter what you do to God, God will continue to love you. It's the always unbreaking, um, forever love of God. It's the love that we sang about earlier, the, the reckless love of God that He's constantly pursuing you, not giving up on you. That is the kind of love that we are called to have for one another. And if we are bearing with one another with that kind of love, it's going to produce unity. On these five things, the theologian and pastor John Stott writes this, here, then, are five foundation stones of Christian unity. Where these are absent, no external structure of unity can stand. But when this strong base has been laid, then there is good hope that a visible unity can be built. We may be quite sure that no unity is pleasing to God, which is not the child of charity. Charity meaning love. Five foundation stones of Christian unity. Christian unity is built upon these five things. And these five seemingly small and insignificant things possess great power. Power for change. Power to bring diverse and different people together in incredible spirit-empowered unity. There was a movie just released that people are... Uh, rather up in arms about, is getting quite a lot of press. It is the new Avengers superhero movie in the Infinity War, part one. And the main villain is trying to track down six Infinity Stones because if he has these six small yet powerful stones, he can really rule the universe and change the universe as we know it. Well, as John Stott said, these five foundation stones of Christian unity though small, though seemingly insignificant, when put into practice by followers of Jesus, have infinite power to change the world as we know it. Can you imagine the difference if the people of God would truly be humble, gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love at all times? Now, while these five things are, as I said, the fruit of the Spirit, what the Holy Spirit is producing in our lives, Paul doesn't allow us to just sit back passively and wait for these things to be developed so that unity can happen. No, we have a responsibility. There is work to be done. That's why he goes on to say, bearing with one another in love, verse 3, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. We're to make every effort. That is to do your absolute best, to give 100% effort at keeping the unity of the Spirit. 
We have to work hard for this. It reminds me of uh, something I've been doing for the last couple months, and that is I'm an assistant coach on my daughter's 8U uh, girls softball team. And it's a lot of fun and also very frustrating. But uh, it, we have eight, nine-year-old girls, and we have one rule that we, we preach to them all the time, every practice, every game, and that is it doesn't matter if we win or lose, even though we're undefeated. <laughs> doesn't matter if we win or lose, what matters is that every player gives 100% effort. Did you do your best? And so after we win, we go out to the outfield and we, we take a knee in the grass and, and the girls are always asking, did we win, did we win? And we don't, tell, we don't answer that question. The coach and I just look at each other and we nod at each other. Um, but we don't tell them whether or not we won because that's not the important thing. Instead, we go around, did you give your best effort? Did you give your best effort? Did you give 100%? And, and you know what's amazing when we ask that question? It's always the same answer. Did you give 100%? And the girls say, yes. Yes, we did. And the other coach and I look at each other and we think, did you really? Because I'm pretty sure there were many plays during the game that were not bad plays. But I know you could give better effort than that. How often for us, when it comes to conflict and when it comes to living out these five things and when it comes to attempting to keep unity within the church and between brothers and sisters in Christ, how many times can we really say we gave 100% to that task? That we truly gave our best effort. That as Paul says, we make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. If I were to ask you, are you giving your best effort? Could you truly say yes? Because that's what the Spirit is working to do, to unify us with a bond that is unbreakable. In fact, that's what the Bond of peace means. The, the word bond there is related to the word that Paul uses in verse 1 for prisoner. Meaning chained together. That, that we as the people of God are literally bound and chained together with an unbreaking bond. That is what the Spirit is working to produce in the church. Are you making every effort to keep that unity in the bond of peace between the brothers and sisters of the church. Can you truly say you gave 100%? But it begs the question, why? Why should we do this? Why make such an effort? Why do these five things need to define the followers of Jesus? And the answer is because these five things defined Jesus himself. They're attributes that he lived out. Can you say that Jesus was humble, gentle, patient, bearing with you and me and our sin in love? Well, that's exactly what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, where he says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Do you remember the definition of gentleness? Not exploiting your personal rights, but instead laying aside your personal rights for the sake of unity. Jesus, who was God, had all the rights and privileges as God. He was the eternal God. And yet he did not exploit that fact. Instead, look at what it says in verse 7. Instead, he emptied himself. That means he laid aside his rights and privileges as God. He did not cease to be God. Jesus, though he was a man, was fully God, yet laid aside his rights and privileges as God. In order, as he says, to assume the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. When he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. 
Why do we need to be humble, gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love? Why are we to live like this? We live like this because Jesus lived like this and Jesus died like this. And the shame is, oftentimes we don't live like this. We love to receive this. How often are we giving this? You know, as a pastor, I have the privilege to be a part of some of the most wonderful times in people's lives. I get to officiate weddings and see a new marriage created. I get to be in the delivery room after the birth of a first child to celebrate with the family, the establishment of a new family. There's all kinds of great things I get to see, but there's also some horrific things I get to see. One of the hardest is I get a front row seat to conflict in the church, to people who are feuding and not getting along. And there's a common thread that, that, that is true of every single situation of conflict I've ever seen. It's that these five things are not present in those relationships. There is no humility. There is no gentleness. There's no patience. People don't bear with one another. And there's a lack of love, even among people who have been so loved and blessed by God in Christ. How shameful it is that we, the church, that's supposed to be a beacon of light to the world about God's incredible love and grace for his people, can't even get along with each other. We show the world that we're just as dysfunctional and unloving as everybody else. It should not be that way. And so how about you? Do you live as those who are keeping the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace? By living humble, gentle, patient lives, bearing with one another in love. Are these things that are true of you? Whether inside the church or outside the church, these are not just things given to us when we deal with those in the family of God. These are things that should be part of us at all times. Are these things true of you? Are you humble, gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love as you're sitting in traffic? When you're in the slow line of the grocery store and that checker is doing a product check over and over and over again. When you're posting on social media or when you're responding to an offensive post on social media. When you're frustrated with your coworkers or your employees or your boss as you interact with your spouse, as you parent your kids. Are these things true of you? Are these things true of you as you deal with those in the church? As you talk to those who are brothers and sisters in Christ? Are these things true of you when you talk about brothers and sisters of Christ to others? as you're serving alongside brothers and sisters in Christ, as you are being served or as you are serving brothers and sisters in Christ. Are these things true of you? And if our softball coach was here and were to ask you to your face, are you giving 100% effort to the task of keeping the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, could you truly say yes? Live worthy of your calling. And that means you are to live in spirit-empowered unity. But we are to do that because you are called into a new gospel community. You are called into a new gospel community. You know, it's interesting when we talk about the calling that we have received, that we have been adopted and forgiven and chosen and given the gift of the Holy Spirit, we often personalize those things, and rightly so. But we say, I have been forgiven. I have received the Holy Spirit. I have been adopted. And we glory in the fact that this has happened to me, myself, and I. But that's not the truth of the gospel. It's only part of the truth of the gospel. Because the truth of the gospel is that we have not just been saved individually from something, from sin, from death. 
We are saved into something, and what we are saved into is a community. It is the new people of God. We are adopted not into God's family, meaning I am God's son and he is my father and it's him and I together. No, we are saved into the family of God, which is all the people of God. And so we are to live in unity because we have been called into community, a gospel community. And we are to live then with those in the gospel community as one. As I said, the, the unity of the Spirit is the oneness of the Spirit. And Paul now goes on in verses 4 through 6 to give us seven things that are to make us one. Let's read them together. Verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Let's look at those for just a moment. One body. We are not saved into multiple bodies. We are saved into one body. Throughout the New Testament, the church is described as the body of Christ. And we are to be members of that body, united together. Even in other places, Paul goes so far as to say that we are not just independent members of the body like an ear or a nose. No, we need each other together as the body. And only as the body can we truly live the life that God has called us to live. And there is one body. And every local church is a local expression of the greater body. All believers everywhere from all time. We are part of something so much bigger than us. One body. And we are brought into that body and unified into that body by one spirit. The unity, the oneness of the Spirit, it's the oneness that the Spirit brings through the bond of peace, as I said, the chaining together with others. We are bound together with others by the Holy Spirit. And we all have one hope. We, we are all hoping for the same thing. We hope that the uh, return of Jesus is imminent. We have great hope that we will be a part of the new heavens and the new earth, given a new glorified body where there is no more sickness and death and pain and suffering. And we hope these things together not just for me. It's not just you and God forever. If you can't get along with the people in your church, then good luck with eternity because you're stuck with these people forever. We all have one hope. The same hope. One Lord. We all are to be following and serving the same master, the same Lord, the same King. And if we are all serving the same master, we should do it together. We have one faith. What this tells us is that, that we are to believe the same thing. This, is, this means the summation of what we believe as Christians, as the church. It means we believe together in the gospel. And this is so important for us to realize because many people have taken this idea of unity and have taken it way too far and have said unity at any cost. And because there's things that we believe that others don't believe, we start to chuck those things out of the boat so that we can be unified together. But it's not unity at any cost. It's unity at great cost unified around similar belief the gospel without the gospel there is no church without the gospel there is no hope so we are unified around one faith one baptism we are all spiritually baptized into the church into the body of christ by the holy spirit as we talked about earlier but most likely, Paul has in mind here the act of physical water baptism, the symbol, the sign that you are a part of the body of Christ. Baptism is an outward act that shows what has happened to you spiritually is true, that you are now part of the people of God. Think about a wedding ring. A wedding ring is a symbol, a physical outward symbol of a spiritual, emotional, sexual, and volitional oneness between two people. That's what this means. In the same way, baptism is a symbol for Christians in the church 
to show the others in the church that they are one with them. And so have you been baptized, showing your church that you believe the one faith, serve the one Lord, possess the one hope, are indwelt by the one spirit, and are a part of the one body? That's what baptism means. And then finally, one God. One God who is called our Father, who is completely and totally sovereign over all things, is working his will and his plan through all things. And he is called our Father, showing that this new people, this new community that we are brought into is a family. We are literally adopted into God's family. And he is our Father. And you know what they say, blood is thicker than being a part of the family means something. You are now family with those in the body of Christ. And as you look at the things that are to unite us, compare them now with the things that often divide us. Go ahead and put those up. Economics. Rich versus poor, race or skin color, gender, men and women, language, education, personality, age. We let these things throughout the years separate and divide the church. But let me ask you, which list is more important? Let me ask you, for you, which list is more important? Which list do you spend more time thinking about as you interact with those in the body of Christ? Do you spend more time thinking about the things that divide us or the things that unite us? Because these things are so much more powerful and more important than anything that can divide us. But here's the problem. The church has so much conflict. Why? Why? Why has there been so much division throughout church history? Why do we experience division and conflict in churches now? In fact, last night after preaching at our Saturday night service, I had a woman come up to me and said she was here because they had left a church they'd been at for 16 years because of conflict. Why? It's because we care so much more about these things. And we should not. We have one body that we are a part of, brought together by one spirit, called to one hope, serving one Lord, believing one faith, being baptized into one body with one God who is our Father over the family of God. Which list is more important to you? If you're not a Christian and you're here today, first off, we are so glad that you're here. And maybe one of the reasons that you're not a Christian or you've been reluctant to come to a church is because you have seen conflict in churches. And for that, if that is you, we are, we are sorry. We are sorry that the goodness and greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ has been obscured because of the people in Jesus' church. And I would ask you, I would ask you to do me a favor, and that is don't judge Jesus. Don't judge his gospel, and don't judge his church based upon the sinful and flawed people in those churches. Because we are all a work in progress. We are sinners saved by grace, and we have not arrived yet. There is still work to be done in each of us. And if you're not a Christian, may I ask that you seriously consider who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for you, and what Jesus offers you in the good news of the gospel, forgiveness, adoption into God's family, the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And would you consider those things before walking away from the church based on the actions of the flawed people that are in those churches? You are to live in spirit-empowered unity because you are called to a new gospel community. 
in the moments before Jesus was arrested, he prayed that we would be one. He then died on the cross to make us one. The Holy Spirit was sent to bind us together as one. That is our calling. And so let me ask you, are you living worthy of your calling? I'm going to invite the worship team up as we pray. God, we come before you and acknowledge that we fall short of what you desire of us. We are not unified as we should be. We don't live humble, gentle, patient lives, bearing with one another in love as we should. And so we thank you, Lord, that even though we fall short, your grace is great enough to forgive all of our sin, even as we sin against one another in your church. And God, we pray for your Holy Spirit to empower us and give us the ability to live, live these kinds of lives. That your Holy Spirit would bring this kind of unity to the people of Grace Church and to all churches that believe your gospel. And God, may we be a part of making every effort, giving 100% to preserve this unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.